Chapter Eight of Memoir of Jane Austen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Memoir of Jane Austen by James Edward Austen Lee. Chapter Eight slow growth of her fame, ill success of first attempts at publication, two reviews of her works contrasted. Seldom has any literary reputation been of such slow growth as that of Jane Austen. Readers of the present day know the rank that is generally assigned to her. They have been told by Archbishop Whatley, in his review of her works, and by Lord Macaulay, in his review of Madame D'Arblay's, the reason why the highest place is to be awarded to Jane Austen, as a truthful drawer of character, and why she is to be classed with those who have approached nearest, in that respect, to the great master Shakespeare. They see her safely placed, by such authorities, in her niche, not indeed amongst the highest orders of genius, but in one confessedly her own, and our British temple of literary fame, and it may be difficult to make them believe how coldly her works were at first received, and how few readers had any appreciation of their peculiar merits. Sometimes a friend or neighbor, who chanced to know of our connection with the author, would condescend to speak with moderate approbation of Sense and Sensibility or Pride and Prejudice. But if they had known that we, in our secret thoughts, classed her with Madame D'Arblay or Miss Edgeworth, or even with some other novel writers of the day, whose names are now scarcely remembered, they would have considered it an amusing instance of family conceit. To the multitude her works appeared tame and commonplace, poor in coloring, and sadly deficient in incident and interest. It is true that we were sometimes cheered by hearing that a different verdict had been pronounced by more competent judges. We were told how some great statesman or distinguished poet held these works in high estimation. We had the satisfaction of believing that they were most admired by the best judges, and comforted ourselves with Horace's satis est equitum mihi plaudere. So much was this the case, that one of the ablest men of my acquaintance said, in that kind of jest which is made earnest in it, that he had established it in his own mind as a new test of ability, whether people could or could not appreciate Miss Austen's merits. But though such golden opinions were now and then gathered in, yet the wide field of public taste yielded no adequate return either in praise or profit. Her reward was not to be the quick return of the cornfield, but the slow growth of the tree which is to endure to another generation. Her first attempts at publication were very discouraging. In November 1797, her father wrote the following letter to Mr. Cadell. Sir, I have in my possession a manuscript novel, comprising three volumes, about the length of Miss Burney's Evelina. As I am well aware of what consequence it is that a work of this sort should make its first appearance under a respectable name, I apply to you. I shall be much obliged, therefore, if you will inform me whether you choose to be concerned in it, what will be the expense of publishing it at the author's risk, and what you will venture to advance for the property of it, if on perusal it is approved of. Should you give any encouragement, I will send you the work. I am, sir, your humble servant, George Austin, Steventon, near Overton, Hans, 1st November, 1797. This proposal was declined by return of post. The work thus summarily rejected must have been Pride and Prejudice. The fate of Northanger Abbey was still more humiliating. It was sold in 1803 to a publisher in Bath for ten pounds, but it found so little favor in his eyes that he chose to abide by his first loss rather than risk farther expense by publishing such a work. It seems to have lain for many years unnoticed in his drawers, somewhat as the first chapters of Waverley lurked forgotten amongst the old fishing tackle in Scott's cabinet. Tilney's, Thorpe's, and Moreland's consigned apparently to eternal oblivion, but when four novels of steadily increasing success had given the writer some confidence in herself, she wished to recover the copyright of this early work. One of her brothers undertook the negotiation. 
he found the purchaser very willing to receive back his money and to resign all claim to the copyright. When the bargain was concluded and the money paid, but not till then, the negotiator had the satisfaction of informing him that the work which had been so lightly esteemed was by the author of Pride and Prejudice. I do not think that she was herself much mortified by the want of early success. She wrote for her own amusement. Money, though acceptable, was not necessary for the moderate expenses of her quiet home. Above all, she was blessed with a cheerful, contented disposition and a humble mind. And so lowly did she esteem her own claims that when she received 150 pounds from the sale of Sense and Sensibility, she considered it a prodigious recompense for that which had cost her nothing. It cannot be supposed, however, that she was altogether insensible to the superiority of her own workmanship over that of some contemporaries who were then enjoying a brief popularity. Indeed, a few touches in the following extracts from two of her letters show that she was as quick-sighted to absurdities in composition as to those in living persons. Mr. C.'s opinion has gone down in my list, but as my paper relates only to Mansfield Park, I may fortunately excuse myself from entering Mr. D.'s. I will redeem my credit with him by writing a close imitation of self-control as soon as I can. I will improve upon it. My heroine shall not only be wafted down an American river in a boat by herself. She shall cross the Atlantic in the same way, and never stop till she reaches Gravesend. We have got Roseanne in our society, and find it much as you describe it, very good and clever, but tedious. Mrs. Hawkins' great excellence is on serious subjects. There are some very delightful conversations and reflections on religion, but on lighter topics I think she falls into many absurdities, and as to love, her heroine has very comical feelings. There are a thousand improbabilities in the story. Do you remember the two Miss Ormsdens introduced just at last? Very flat and unnatural. Mademoiselle Cossart is rather my passion. Two notices of her works appeared in the Quarterly Review, one in October 1815, and another, more than three years after her death, in January 1821. The latter article is known to have been from the pen of Watley, afterwards Archbishop of Dublin. They differ much from each other in the degree of praise which they award, and I think also it may be said, in the ability with which they are written. The first bestows some approval, but the other expresses the warmest admiration. One can scarcely be satisfied with the critical acumen of the former writer, who, in treating of sense and sensibility, takes no notice whatever of the vigor with which many of the characters are drawn, but declares that the interest and merit of the piece depends altogether upon the behavior of the elder sister. Nor is he fair when, in Pride and Prejudice, he represents Elizabeth's change of sentiments towards Darcy as caused by the side of his house and grounds. But the chief discrepancy between the two reviewers is to be found in their appreciation of the commonplace and silly characters to be found in these novels. On this point the difference almost amounts to a contradiction, such as one sometimes sees drawn up in parallel columns when it is desired to convict some writer or some statesman of inconsistency. The reviewer in 1815 says, The faults of these works arise from the minute detail which the author's plan comprehends. Characters of folly or simplicity, such as those of Old Woodhouse and Miss Bates, are ridiculous when first presented, but if too often brought forward, or too long dwelt on, their prosing is apt to become as tiresome in fiction as in real society. The reviewer, in 1821, on the contrary, singles out the fools as a special instances of the writer's abilities, and declares that in this respect she shows a regard to character hardly exceeded by Shakespeare himself. These are his words. Like him, Shakespeare, she shows as admirable a discrimination in the character of fools as of people of sense, a merit which is far from common. To invent, indeed, a conversation full of wisdom or of wit requires that the writer should himself possess ability. But the converse does not hold good. It is no fool that can describe fools well, and many who have succeeded pretty well in painting superior characters have failed in giving individuality to those weaker ones, which it is necessary to introduce in order to give a faithful representation of real life. They exhibit to us mere folly in the abstract, 
forgetting that to the eye of the skillful naturalist the insects on a leaf present as wide differences as exist between the lion and the elephant. Slender and shallow and egg-cheek, as Shakespeare has painted them, though equally fools, resemble one another no more than Richard and Macbeth and Julius Caesar, and Miss Sawson's Mrs. Bennet, Mr. Rushworth and Miss Bates, are no more alike than her Darcy, Knightley, and Edmund Bertram. Some have complained, indeed, of finding her fools too much like nature, and consequently tiresome. There is no disputing about tastes. All we can say is, that such critics must, whatever deference they may outwardly pay to received opinions, find the merry wives of Windsor and Twelfth Night very tiresome, and that those who look with pleasure at Wilkie's pictures, or those of the Dutch school, must admit that excellence of imitation may confer attraction on that which would be insipid or disagreeable in the reality. Her minuteness of detail has also been found fault with, but even where it produces, at the time, a degree of tediousness, we know not whether that can justly be reckoned a blemish, which is absolutely essential to a very high excellence. Now it is absolutely impossible, without this, to produce that thorough acquaintance with the characters which is necessary to make the reader heartily interested in them. Let any one cut out from the Iliad, or from Shakespeare's plays, everything, we are far from saying that either might not lose some parts with advantage, but let him reject everything, which is absolutely devoid of importance and interest, and he will find that what is left will have lost more than half its charms. We are convinced that some writers have diminished the effect of their works by being scrupulous to admit nothing into them which had not some absolute and independent merit. They have acted like those who strip off the leaves of a fruit tree, as being of themselves good for nothing with the view of securing more nourishment to the fruit, which in fact cannot attain its full maturity and flavor without them. The world, I think, has endorsed the opinion of the later writer, but it would not be fair to set down the discrepancy between the two entirely to the discredit of the former. The fact is that in the course of the intervening five years, these works have been read and re-read by many leaders in the literary world. The public taste was forming itself all this time, and grew by what it fed on. These novels belong to a class which gain rather than lose by frequent perusals, and it is probable that each reviewer represented fairly enough the prevailing opinions of readers in the year when each wrote. Since that time, the testimonies in favor of Jane Austen's works have been continual and almost unanimous. They are frequently referred to as models nor had they lost their first distinction of being especially acceptable to minds of the highest order. I shall indulge myself by collecting into the next chapter instances of the homage paid to her by such persons. End of chapter 8 Recording by Leanne Howlett